This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, we, we talked about the fact of these hallmarks, right, as delineated in the paper by Hannah Hanna Weinberg that you read. Uh, uh, what, what, that we, sorry, reboot. It's that thing, it stopped me. Yeah. We talk about self-sufficiency and growth signals, right, the fact that the, the cancer cells will either break something inside or they will induce something from other cells such that they get all of the growth signals that they need. Right? That was sort of the brick on the accelerator that I talked about. And then we talked about the insensitivity to anti-growth signals, the fact that, that normal cells, when they're surrounded on all sides by other cells, stop dividing. Right? That, uh, is that contact dependent or density dependent inhibition. And we, we talked uh, a little bit here about the whole cheek thing, right? the telomerase, the, the maintenance of the telomeres. So every time a cell divides, the telomeres get shortened a little bit uh, in our cells, and that shortening of the telomeres is associated with replicative senescence, i.e. they stop dividing. Uh, and so cancer cells have to overcome that. Uh, there are two ways that cancer cells seem to overcome this. One is by reactivating the telomerase gene. Uh, on your map, it's right here, TERT is the telomerase reverse transcriptase, TERT, right? So that TERT gene, or H-TERT for the human version, uh, is uh, responsible for maintaining the telomeres. About 90% of cancer cells will restart uh, the expression of TERT, which is normally turned off uh, in adult tissues. But 10% of cancer cells, therefore, don't do that. And they maintain their telomeres in an alternative way, it's called the alternative lengthening of telomere pathway, which we'll talk about. Uh, we're going to go into all of these in more detail, right? Uh, so they do that by a recombination-based method. So no matter what, they have to maintain their telomeres in order to keep dividing. And the cancer cells have to avoid apoptosis or apoptosis. They have to stop uh, the suicide, essentially, the program death. Uh, that occurs uh, when cells recognize that they're dividing in an unregulated manner. And we'll talk in the first several papers, we're going to talk about how it is that cancer uh, cells get away with it. What is it that uh, is recognized in a cell that's running amok? What's caught, right? What is the red flag uh, for a cell that's dividing when it's not supposed to be? Uh, but all cancer cells have to be able to avoid apoptosis. There's lots of ways that cells die. Uh, you could slam your hand in a car door, for instance, and crush a bunch of cells. They would die by necrosis, massive death. Apoptosis is a very particular, very orderly process in which the cells die, and we're going to spend a good bit of time on it, right? Because uh, the goal of chemotherapy in most cancer treatments is to induce apoptosis, right? Uh, and this is pretty much what you need. One through four will get you to uh, a group of cells that is growing in an abnormal way. If a tumor is going to succeed, if it's going to get any bigger than a pinhead, right, very, very small, they have to develop a blood supply. Right? And genesis, we know, right, the biblical term, genesis, creation, angio refers to blood vessels. Angiogenesis, the creation of a blood supply. Okay. And uh, angiogenesis, uh, and, they, and, it, and they say sustained, i.e., if you take it away, if, this, if the blood vessels are blocked for some reason or, or fall apart, those cells are not going to get the nutrients they need, they're not going to get the oxygen they need, and they're going to die. Okay. Uh, so any cancer that gets big enough to cause harm to a human other than some of the leukemias, which are already in the blood, right, any solid tumor, you can assume that if it's causing problems, it has angiogenesis. Right? Otherwise, they're, they're only teeny tiny little thing. Yeah. Did you say this number five only applies to solid tumor and not the one that's... Well, leukemia is... There, there is evidence that angiogenesis is actually relevant for lymphomas, which can form solid masses, although their blood's made from blood cells, 
But some of the leukemias, there's not as much. I mean, it, it's certainly not used to treat leukemia, the anti-angiogenesis treatments. Not as clear. But certainly all solid tumors, it's unequivocal, right, that it must have a blood supply. Uh, and again, we'll come back and talk, to, talk about all of these. This is just sort of an overview, right? Uh, uh, tissue invasion and metastasis. Right? 90 percent of cancer deaths, 9 zero, 9 out of 10 deaths caused by cancer are caused by metastasis. That is when the cancer moves to a distant location. Uh, and so metastasis is crucial uh, for the growth of the tumor. It's equally crucial for us to try to understand how to prevent it. Right? Uh, because metastasis is a really abnormal process. You go to bed at night. You say good night to all your body parts. Good night, prostate. Good night, spleen. Good night, liver. Right? Cause you, and you know where they all are, right? When you wake up, are you pretty confident where they that they're where you left them? Right? It seems like a no-brainer, right? Of course, my breast cells are in my breast where I left them. Right? My prostate cells are in my prostate, but that doesn't work for cancer. Right? It's extremely abnormal if you think about a, a breast cell leaving the breast and going to the brain. I'm going to go to the lungs. I'm going to go to the liver. Okay? Completely different world. Uh, and how that happens, how it's controlled is very complex. We'll talk about it, but it's really important to understand. There are currently no treatments actually approved to target really metastasis which is the thing that causes 90% of deaths. So, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. So sometimes you'll see, and we, we, I think I probably have some pictures later in the course of, of people that have just massive tumors sometimes, or you'll hear about a, a woman that had a 60-pound ovarian tumor or something taken out. A lot of these happen in, in Eastern Europe for some reason. I don't know. Ukraine. Here, my tumor, you know. Um, so so for, for whatever reason, uh, these tumors are, are very large, but they don't spread. They're encapsulated. So it's okay. Uh, you, they tend to form in the abdomen where there's space to compress things without causing death, right? Or they'll form outside the body, right? On a, you know, a big uh, a thing like that, right? Where, where hanging out, it doesn't impede your, your lungs or your liver or something like that, right? Uh, otherwise, it would, by compression, cause problems. Um, they will, of course, sap the person of nutrients and energy and stuff, but they tend not to kill. But again, it's because they're contained. Even though they're big, they're still not going to other places. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and sustained angiogenesis, just to, to throw in a, a thing here for you, the fact that you have a blood supply in a tumor immediately gives that tumor routes to the rest of the body. Right? So uh, these, are not, uh, these two things are not unlinked. Right? If you have a blood supply uh, in a tumor, it's not normal. We'll talk about that. It's not a normal vasculature, not normal blood vessels. Uh, and those blood vessels provide a route right, for the cancer cells to get in there, and then they can go anywhere in the body because the blood supply is everywhere. Right? Uh, and all of these, as well as additional hallmarks, which we'll learn about later, uh, which were uh, documented in a paper that came out 10 years after the one you read. Uh, all of them are driven by an underlying genetic instability. So again, as I said before, cancer is a genetic disease. Right? It, is, it is a defect uh, uh, in specific genes that accumulate over time. And this genetic instability allows for the evolution of cells that have only one or two of these traits, these phenotypes, to get more of them, right? By virtue of the fact that they are unstable genetically. They acquire more mutations than Joe average cell. Okay. okay. So tumors. Uh, when you get a tumor, when you get a mass, uh, it was, it's now fairly well worked out, but it was a very good question to ask, is, is this because a single cell 
uh, goes out, strikes out on its own, or is it a group of cells all within an area? That's reasonable to think, right, that these five cells all just sort of headed off uh, the reservation, right, and, and formed cancer. The, the current thinking is that in almost all cases, there are always exceptions. It's biology we're talking about, right? Uh, there's always exceptions, but in virtually all cases, cancers are thought to be monoclonal. That is, that you have a population of cells and one of those cells uh, becomes the cancerous clone. Right. When you think of clone, you tend to think of you know, cloning whole animals, but to clone really means just to isolate an individual. So a clone is all of the progeny of a single original cell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you so last, last class, I thought you said if you were looking at it like a tumor and you look at two cells next to each other, they wouldn't be identical? That's true. Okay. They are true, but, but they're genetically unstable. So they arise from a single cell, but it's not a stable cell. So as it divides, it is forming daughter cells, which are not exactly the same as each other. So they're both true. So the, the, the original tumor arises from a single cell, but that cell is, forms a heterogeneous blob. Okay? Yeah, that's a good question. So how do we know that they're, that they're uh, monoclonal? As, as she just said, these tumors are super heterogeneous. Hetero there's all this heterogeneity in there. How do we know that, that, they're, that they even did arise from a single cell? And there's multiple ways now. Of course, now we would do deep sequencing, right? You would <laughs> sequence the cells, and you would be able to go back and trace it back. But uh, the way it was done initially was by looking at X inactivation. Everyone under, remembers X inactivation. Females have two Xs. One of them is turned off in every cell. Uh, uh, early on during embryogenesis, a decision is made. One of those Xs is turned off, and that X stays off forever right? in the, the, the progeny of that cell. And so if you have people who are heterozygous, if there are two didn't Xs full of genes, as we said before, right? it's chock full of genes. If you have someone who's heterozygous for... Uh, gene onto X, what we can do is we can look in that tumor and we can say every single one of these has this X on. Right? Every one of these has this X on in this tumor over here. So that's one way that people were able to look and say, no, it's not a mixture, right? It's only a single cell. It's very unlikely otherwise, right, for it to be all the same. Another way is by looking at uh, one of the blood cancers called the myeloma. And myelomas are cancers that affect B cells. B cells are the immune cells that make antibodies. Right? That's their job in life, is to make an uh, antibody. And any given B cell makes only one type of antibody. Right? We have lots of different ones, so we have lots of different antibodies. But any given B cell makes only one kind of antibody. Right? Their antibody manufacturing machines. That's all they do. All right? And if you look in the blood of someone who has what's called multiple myeloma, that doesn't mean they have, it's a, it's a weird term, it sounds like they have diff, multiple different cancers. They have one cancer, but it's in more than one spot. Okay, So multiple myeloma is only one cancer. Uh, and if you look in the serum of these people, you'll find that they have a huge spike of a very particular single antibody. Right? So again, it shows that all of these cells, they're different from each other for the reasons we said. They're unstable, but they originated from this one cell. Right? It's a clonal disease. Okay? So there is this peak uh, of antibody. You can actually detect these things. That the antibodies, when people have this cancer, they make so much of this protein that you can detect it in their urine. Right? You can actually look in their urine and you can, you can purify the antibody uh, proteins. Right. So, all right. I, I feel like people are pretty convinced, certainly historically. People, do you have a question? So at what point does our body start to consider them as non-self? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, one of the, no is the answer. 
But, but cancer cells do tend to re-express G proteins uh, on their surface, genes that are not expressed by adult cells, like embryonic antigens and stuff that are recognizable uh, by the immune system. Uh, but internally, they're recognized as abnormal probably beforehand, right? That sort of apoptotic, hey, something's wrong with me inside, probably happens before you would express something on the outside that would be visible. So the cells are, are monoclonal, right? They derive from a single cell that just goes bad, right? It acquires this set of mutations that, that it needs to have these characteristics, these phenotypes. But are all cancer cells the same? And this is actually a huge debate, and it has major implications on treatment, okay? And so there is a, a theory uh, that, that cancer cells... Uh, even if you look in a tumor, the cancer cells are not all the same. There's essentially like a general cell, and then there are the soldiers, or something to that effect. That may not be a great analogy, but there's uh, cells that are driving the proliferation, these cancer stem cells. And so you, you are familiar with the term of stem cells, these cells that proliferate, they, re, they, re, they reproduce and replace cells that are dying in our body, or, of course, embryonic stem cells that, that form an embryo. But essentially, the cancer stem cell, and you'll see this term all the time, or CSC, this cancer stem cell uh, idea is that there's a small population of cancer cells that is essentially doing almost all of the replication. And the bulk of the cancer cells, if you look in a tumor and there's a thousand cells in their cancer cells, obviously there's more, but if you were to look at a thousand of them, almost all of them really aren't multiplying a lot. It's just a small subset that are in there that are doing most of the division. And from a treatment perspective, this is a huge deal, right? Because if we're treating cancer based on the phenotype of the, the ones out here, we're attacking the wrong ones, right? The stem cells, which are doing all the division, uh, are thought to be genetically and phenotypically, genotypically a little different, right? And this is still being worked out, but there is evidence for it. Um, so if you take cancer cells uh, that are, are found in cancer, they don't uh, divide rapidly, and they're often replaced. Um, you know, it, you would think for instance, that if someone has cancer and we talk about cancer as this unkillable, unstoppable, dividing thing, it's very, very hard to take cancer out of a person and make a, a cell line out of that, right, and grow that cancer in the lab. Um, and maybe that's because we don't uh, have them. When in the model systems that you're going to see in the class, when they inject uh, cancer cells into these animals to mimic human cancer, how many cells do they inject? 2 million, 10 million, right? If you only need one, right, because all of them are equal, then that doesn't seem right, right? It seems like you should be able to inject five, right? <laughs> but often you have to inject very large amounts. And people have nowadays using fluorescent activated cell sorting, fax analysis, where you can actually sort cells based on proteins that are on their surface and collect different populations, people have now identified populations that can form tumors using much, much fewer, right? And then you can have another population, you inject them, and they never form tumors. So the idea is that there's not all cancer cells are created equal. Okay? Uh, and, and I put here, why does it matter? But, it, but for sure, it matters, right? Yeah. That's a, it's, it's, it's a, that's a great question, and there's, there's people that are debating that as we speak. So does cancer arise from stem cells that are aberrant and therefore have this capability already? Or do you take a more differentiated cell and then sort of send it back into a stem cell-like state? Um, and people are working on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, good, that's a great question. But it's been around for a while, right? So identification of pancreatic cancer stem cells, identification of breast cancer cells, right? Here's uh, 
that one, tumor, and then tumor growth need not be driven by rare cancer stem cells. Uh, and efficient tumor formation by single human melanoma cells. So some people say it's not that you need to put in two million, it's that you're putting in cells in a needle, you're injecting them. What you should do is treat them much nicer. Treat it, uh, you put them in with some gel so they're happy in there like they were in the body. It's, it's not so much that you need to put in a bunch of them as much as you're not putting in the right way, right? So this is still being debated, right? I mean, we'll talk about it, we'll see it. Um, people are still trying to figure out how right it is. It may be that some cancers are more dependent on a stem cell-like population and others not. There's no reason it has to be the same for all, all types of cancer. Uh, but it is a really important question because we need to know what we're fighting, right? Uh, we need to be designing the treatments against the right cell population. Okay? And one of the ways uh, that people are doing this is by actually creating cancer stem cells, by starting with uh, non-stem cells, right? And what you do is you put in factors that are really active during embryogenesis, right? We, it goes back, if any of you had developmental biology, what we're talking about is the activation of the Hox genes and things like that, right? Um, so, so these are early stage transcription factors that work very early, OCT4 and NANOG and things like that, uh, that are required to take a normal cell and make it into a stem cell. Uh, but uh, we can do this now. Okay. Now, uh, I wanted to just talk about just essentially some terminology more than anything else, the process by which cancer uh, is uh, named. Right? Uh, it's a smooth process, but humans have a need to classify things, right? And name things. So uh, we're going to talk about that. So hyperplasia. In hyperplasia, the cells appear normal, but there's just too many of them. Hyper, right? Hyperplasia, right? Plasia refers to growth. Neoplasia, new growth, right? Cancer. Uh, so this can occur in a normal uh, response to normal signals, and it can, and it, it can go away. So hyperplasia or hyperplastic uh, situation can go away uh, if uh, the signal is removed. In metaplasia, one cell type is actually invaded. You have different cell types that invade uh, and displace nearby cells, and the invaders actually look normal if you look at them under the microscope, but it's an abnormal condition and uh, the, it can lead to increased risk of cancer. One of the, the good examples of this is something called Barrett's esophagus, in, in which the secretory epithelium, the low down portion of the esophagus, closer to the stomach, invades the squamous epithelium. And when it does that, you get this weird uh, structure. You get this, this uh, here's where it would happen, where these two things meet. And it gives you a 30-fold increased risk of esophageal cancer. Right? Uh, it's not uncommon to have cancers form where two different tissues join, probably because there's a lot of cell division occurring at those junctions. Right? Cervical cancer is at the junction of the cervix and the vagina. Okay. Two different kinds of tissue joining, right? Uh, it's, again, not uncommon for, for this to happen. In dysplasia, or dysplastic condition, the cells don't look right anymore. And if someone is diagnosed with cancer, one of the things that will be done is that a biopsy almost always will be taken and the cells will be examined under a microscope, and they try to determine how weird do these cells look. Uh, and so what happens is you're looking for an altered nuclear shape or size. The nucleus in cancer cells is almost always much bigger, and that's because they have more DNA, right? Uh, they, they, they're abnormal, they're aneuploid, right? And they, they acquire more DNA, and they have, uh, much, they have much larger nuclei. They have increased mitotic activity. Uh, what they'll look for, the term, the fancy term, is they'll look for mitotic figures. That's the term you'll see on a pathology report. 
And what that means is they're, they're, these cells are, are dead. They're frozen, right? They're looking at them. And what they're looking for is the, that beautiful thing you see when you look at onions dividing, right? The chromosomes separating during anaphase, right? Metaphase. When the chromosomes are condensed and you can see them, that's a mitotic figure. You're looking at mitosis. It's been captured. If you look at a thousand cells and one of them is undergoing division, does that seem better or worse than if 30 of them were doing that? Pretty clear, right? And they'll come up actually with something that's called the mitotic index. So if someone is diagnosed with cancer, they'll say, wow, these cells seem to be a lot of them were dividing. It's probably rapidly growing, right? High, high mitotic index. And in dysplasia, the relative numbers of cells in the tissue is no longer observed. So the ratio of, of the epithelial cells to secretory cells to sensory cells, whatever, is no longer imbalanced, right? This, this thing is, is messed up. So here are dysplastic cells, right? You can see the great big nucleus. There's just a teeny bit of cytoplasm surrounding these. Sometimes you can barely see the cytoplasm in a cancer cell, whereas a normal cell, you have a teeny little nucleus, right? And lots and lots of cytoplasm, right? So it, the ratio is way, way off. Right? Yeah? At this point, do you call it cancer? Uh, yeah. Well, it depends if it's invading, right? Because cancer is all about that, right? Um, so that's exactly right, the, the, the next sort of concept, right? And the two terms uh, that, you would, that you would use to describe tumors or growth, masses, are a benign growth. That's one that doesn't invade. So the, the woman or man that you were talking about with the massive tumor, right, that's a benign tumor, right? You would never really see someone who had a 60-pound tumor hanging off of them that was malignant because it would have already spread and killed them. Right? Um, so a benign growth is one that does not invade neighboring tissues, and they can get very large. And can a benign growth kill you? How about if you have a benign growth in your brain? Yeah, right? I mean, there's only so much space up there, right? So certainly benign tumors through compression uh, can, and can influence other organs uh, and cause problems, but in general, uh, they don't. Malignant growth invade and spread, and by definition, this is cancer, right? So cancer is when it invades and spreads uh, and uh, is able to move to distant areas, right? It leaves its uh, place of origin. Yeah? So, was, I guess I'm getting confused because I thought invading and then the spreading part was the past. That is. Ninety percent of deaths due to cancer are caused by metastatic growth. But yeah. if there is no treatment for metastasis, once it's reached that point, yep. is it like a, like it, it Well, there's nothing to stop metastasis. We can treat the cancer once it's moved. We just treat it like it was when it was in the original place. Right? But there's nothing specific. We don't have a drug where we can say, all right, you have breast cancer, but we're going to keep it right where it is, and we're going to treat this like diabetes. You're going to take a pill every day or a shot, right, like insulin. We're going to take it every day. It's going to stay in your breast. It's never going to move, and so you're never going to have a problem. We don't have anything like that, right? We don't have any way of stopping cancer from spreading at this point. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't get treated with a drug that's going to treat it in different places. Everyone see the difference? Right? We can't prevent metastasis with any yeah. I mean, the, the point is, any I don't know about that, but but I'm not a radiologist, or whatever. But but if they radiate something, it's to kill cells that they think might be there. It's not going to stop them from going afterwards, right? If you stop radiation on day eight, on day nine, you could be seated and get cancer. Right? They, they, would, they would radiate only to kill things that they think are already there. It's not going to stop anything from going there later. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, is it possible for a tumor to uh, be uh, non-malignant but still take 
a lot of the essential nutrients out of the bloodstream and it could kill a person that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mentioned that, right, that, that, that it, it, it could sap you of, of nutrients and stuff, but people tend to, can get really big tumors and it doesn't, I guess they just eat more. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> You know, real seriously, you know, I mean, they, they may not be healthy, right? They may be weak, they may have bone problems, depending on, and, and some tumors, even benign tumors that are secreting hormones can cause major problems, right? Because there are tumors that will do that, and they can really mess you up without you getting big or invading. Uh, but in general, uh, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about cancer. It's something that can invade. So types of cancer, uh, carcinoma, right? These are these are cells that are de- these are cancers that are derived from epithelial cells, cells that line our skin and our organs. About 80% of cancers are carcinomas, right? So the the majority of cancers are that. Breast cancer, it's it's lining the duct, right? Very common, or the lobule. So it's a lining of an empty, hollow space. That's an epithelial cell. Prostate cancer, what does the prostate do? It makes prostatic fluid, which it secretes. It's a tube, it's a duct, it's secreting stuff, that's epithelial cell. Colon, tube, epithelial cell. Skin, epithelial cells, right? So uh, the, the, the bulk of cancers are carcinomas. Uh, if, in fact, the tissue's normal job is to secrete things. If it's a secretory tissue, like the cells that line the lungs, which secrete fluid to lubricate the lungs, or the colon, which produces all kinds of things to lubricate so the fecal stream can go through, right? It's their secreting. Secretory tissues, the term for it is an adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma. So carcinoma uh, are epithelial cells. Sarcomas are cancers that are derived from muscle, fat, bone, connective tissue, uh, much more uncommon. There are some sarcomas that are specifically affect young people. Uh, there are inherited conditions, and there are cancers that affect uh, young teenagers and, and young people uh, that are sarcomas, uh, but these are much, much less common. Leukemias are derived from white blood cells. Leuco means white. Emia means in the blood, right? Leuco, emia, leukemia, right? White blood cells in, uh, the, in the peripheral blood. You can get lymphomas, right? So here is a lymphoma. And lymphomas are also bone marrow-derived cells, lymphocytes. Uh, but they form sort of solid tumors. That's why I said uh, that lymphomas probably are influenced by angiogenesis, right? Because they do form masses, whereas leukemias tend to spread around. They're already in the bloodstream, right? Distributed, right? Lymphoma. Myelomas involve the B cells uh, or plasma cells. These are the ones we talked about before their job is to make antibodies, right? So this is a B cell, uh, and if you were to look in here, what you would see is tons and tons of endoplasmic reticulum. Why? What does ER do? Protein synthesis. What is a B cell doing? Making antibody, right? They are terminal factories. That's what they do, right? So these are B cells. Yeah? Plasma cells, antibody producing. You can get cancers that are lymphomas, that are B cell derived, that are not myelomas. Good question, yeah. Yeah. So if you, let's say, like, if you're taking immunosuppressants, does that make you more suffering from myelomas? Immunosuppression is linked with increases in cancer. I don't know that it would be particularly just those. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so thus ends the last lecture. <laughs> we're now actually in today, right? Did you know you were in yesterday? Or what is it? Five days ago. We were five days ago, or right? something like that. Right? All right. So what we're going to talk about for the rest of today is is the role of viruses in cancer. Uh, 
Uh, and this is a model of a T cell leukemia virus, uh, and which are associated with some kinds of cancer, but mostly I picked it because I, I like the picture. Okay. So, uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, that the first cancer hospital in the 1700s was actually moved to the countryside because people were afraid uh, that, that cancer could uh, be contagious. It was in the 1800s that a Russian researcher transmitted a tumor from, from one dog to another by actually taking out a chunk of tumor and putting it into another dog. Uh, in a way, that's sort of surprising, right, that it would work because of the histo-incompatibility, right? You still have to worry about that, uh, even with cancer. And uh, so, but uh, it was able to work. In, in 1910, Peyton Rouse, who I mentioned earlier, really, this was the first of the experimental systems to try to study cancer. So the reason we're studying, or starting with viruses is because they were really the beginning of how cancer was, was studied, right? And they were the source of the discovery of the genes of cancer, right? The oncogenes and, and some of the tumor suppressors. So, again, uh, this guy brought this very sick chicken uh, to Peyton Rouse. And what he saw was that he could transplant, uh, chop this uh, tumor up, shred it up, right, mince it up, and he could transplant that to other chickens, right, by injecting. And he could serially do this. He could do it over and over again. You get a new tumor in the new chicken very quickly, and then you could transplant that over and over again. And he did his work. Look when he did his work, and look when he won the Nobel Prize. Right? Nobel Prizes are not awarded posthumously, although even if they were, I don't think he really would have really loved it. Um, uh, so uh, he actually lived long enough to get his Nobel Prize. Okay. Longevity is critical for this stuff. Right? <laughs> right? Barbara McClintock, right? you got a little long time to get your Nobel, right? Okay. So what Rouse did, first he would shred up the sarcoma and, and transplant transplant it, and he showed that the tissue would work. But later, he showed that, in fact, you don't actually have to transplant the tumor. You can actually take up the, the sarcoma, you grind it up with sand, really, really fine, to crush all the cells, right? That's the idea. He was shredding all the cells up, and then he would filter that into something that, through a filter that would catch cells. So he knew that there were no cells coming out here, and when he injected this filtrate, into chickens, lo and behold, they would develop tumors too. Right? So the, the agent, which he called the filterable agent for obvious reasons, right? what he called this agent was something that was smaller than a cell, right? but it was still able to cause cancer in the recipients. The confirmation uh, of what Rouse suspected was that this was a virus. They already knew about viruses, of course. Uh, back then, uh, didn't happen for several decades um, because there was no way to see viruses uh, at the time. But once electron microscopy came around, uh, then they were able actually to visualize uh, these virions, right, the virus particles, uh, which are now called the Rouse sarcoma virus. And Rouse had a great system, right? We're going to talk about different model systems for studying cancer. They all have limitations. They all have weaknesses. Uh, it's important when you read papers to always consider that, right? How many people did they look at? How many mice did they look at? Were they all male? Why did they use this strain? Right? All those things we now know can influence results. But uh, he had a good system. It was very predictable. He could get cancer over and over again. The rapid, uh, the tumors developed within a matter of weeks, very quick. You don't want to wait 10 years if you're doing experiments, right? Uh, and he got a large yield of his cancer-causing agent. Uh, so uh, it was very, uh, a very good system. He did think it was a virus. Uh, he was not surprised. It was filterable. He couldn't see it under a light microscope. And it was labile. It could be destroyed by heat and other things that would denature proteins that would kill a virus. Right? So it, it fit the paradigm at the time uh, that this, this looks like it's a virus, right? It's too small uh, to be anything else that they were aware of, right? So they said oh, it's probably a virus. He didn't know it when he started his work. We now know, and they figured out later, that he was actually working with two different viruses. 
It wasn't one. He was working one with one called the avian leukosis virus, uh, and, which is abbreviated ALV. And he was working with the one uh, that we now call the Rouse sarcoma virus, the one that was actually causing this rapid cancer. Okay. And these viruses differed in their ability to induce tumors. Right? They're different. Uh, so the ALV is a weakly oncogenic virus. It has a long latent period. Latent period means you infect, and then you have to wait a long time until you see a tumor. The latency, right? The time between when you inoculate and when you get a tumor out, right? was a long time. And these viruses were not able to cause transformation from normal cells into transformed cells, abnormal cells. And we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about transformation. We'll come back to this, right? But it wasn't able to transform the cells in, in uh, the laboratory in vitro. Uh, conversely, the acutely transforming viruses, of which RSV was the first one, right? rapidly cause cancer, and they transform cells in culture with very high efficiency. So again, if we take this virus, we put it into this chicken, within just one or two weeks, we're going to get cancer. That's very fast, right? Very, very fast. Uh, we're going to get a cancer arising. If we just take individual cells and we do it in culture, you will get transformation of this cell. This cell can become immortalized, right? It will be altered because of this infection. Uh, whereas these guys can take months to develop uh, cancer, and they don't transform the cells. Okay? Yeah? What is, by transform, do you mean like No. Different, different, different use of the word. Okay. Yeah. So, so transform, the way you've been taught, right, is transformation is when you put naked DNA or something, right, onto something. Here, when we say transform, I'm, taking, I'm talking about taking a cell that has a finite lifespan, that ha there are specific characteristics that go along with being transformed. It's a way of defining a set of characteristics that the altered cell has. And we're going to come back to it, but the, for now, we'll just let it go right there. We will talk about it briefly, right, or, or in, a, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, but these cells are different, right? They're not necessarily mortal. They don't, they don't behave the same way. Okay. But we'll, we'll come back to it, I, I promise. Okay. But transform cells, that's a good question, right? Transform cells, not the same thing as transforming with DNA, right? The, these are cells that act differently. Right? Okay. So in 1970, uh, some researchers, Peter Duisberg and Peter Russell, remember, he did this work in 1910, so you have to fast forward 60 years till we essentially have the tools to try to figure out what's going on at a molecular level. Right? It was a long gap right, uh, to figure that out. And what Duisberg and Vogt did was to compare the genomes of RSV and ALV. And what they found was that ALV was smaller. Right? About one and a half kilobases, thousand bases, smaller. Right? So what does that suggest? If you were guessing, if you were them and you said, wow, this one causes cancer, this one doesn't, this one's bigger that causes cancer than this one that doesn't, what would you think? Yeah? The size uh, correlates with its ability. So wh why is it bigger? Yeah, could it have a gene, right? Is that what you were going to say as well? Uh, so could it have a gene, right? Could it have something in it that ALV doesn't? That's a, that's, that's a good guess, right? I mean, it's bigger and it has a new feature, right? It causes cancer. The other one doesn't cause it nearly as much. So is there a difference? But uh, soon after, right, again, the same group of researchers, they identified a non-transforming mutant of RSV, that could still replicate, right? So it could still reproduce. Replicate meaning this, it could reproduce itself, right? So it was a functional, fully functional form of the virus, and it could still replicate. And the genomic analysis showed that that 1.5 KB was missing, which completely goes with your theory, right? 
Now this, this mutant has lost that 1.5 kb, and now it can't transform. That 1.5 kb must be important, right? That 1.5 kb that's in RSV that's not in ALV must be the part that's causing transformation. That would be the obvious uh, uh, guess, right? And so most acutely transforming retroviruses are defective, and I'll show you why that is. It's kind of minor, uh, but most of them don't work. They need another virus to help them. So the acutely transforming retroviruses carry genes that can induce cancer formation. And we'll show exactly how that was proven. I should, maybe I should move that slide up next year, two years, I promise. Right? Yeah. Transformation is what leads to cancer, right? Trans the, 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 the transformed phenotype are, is, is, is the collection of traits, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, that allow these cells to become cancerous, right? So transformed equals essentially precancer, if you want to think of it that way, right? So uh, again, where, where do these genes come from, right? So Rouse's system provides some clues. If you take a weakly transforming virus, it goes in a chicken, a tumor forms, and then an acutely transforming virus comes out. So it seems that this virus, when it went through the chicken, picked up something, right? This 1.5 KB, this RSV, picked up this, this gene, right, from the chicken. Okay? And to figure it out, uh, what was done was a uh, pretty uh, clever idea. So uh, Michael Bishop and Howard Varmus, uh, these are authors of papers one and three, right? In our class, uh, we're going to read papers written by these two people. Uh, Howard Varmus is, was the head of the National Cancer Institute, right? Um, and, and Peter Vogt. They used a probe to track uh, for the movement of the cancer genes uh, in infected cells. So here's what they did. They took a wild type uh, viral RNA and they, through reverse transcription, they made a cDNA out of that, right? Or copied or complementary DNA. Does everyone know how that works? So they made a DNA copy of the RNA. They got rid of the RNA, mostly because it's a pain to work with, very unstable, right? So now they have this wild type cDNA fragment and they hybridize this to the viral RNA of a transformation defective variant. So here's our wild type cDNA next to a transformation defective uh, mutant. When you allow those to pair together, right? This defective one doesn't have SARC, right? The SARC gene is missing from the transformation deficient one. So if we then get rid of everything that had a mate, the only thing that didn't have a mate is the gene that we're interested in, okay? And here's my version, right? If we pair these things up, right? The one that's uh, transformation defective doesn't have SARC. SARC is the only thing that doesn't have a binding partner. Does everyone get that? So if we destroy everything else, what we're left with is only the piece of DNA that didn't have a partner, the thing that was lost, which is the thing that was causing transformation. Yes? OK. Okay, so what they found was using SARC, looking in normal DNA from human, from mouse, from all kinds of animals, right? They said, wow, we have this, this DNA that we know can cause transformation, and lo and behold, they found it in normal DNA. It's not something unique to cancer. It could very well have been, but the answer was no, right? This gene that causes transformation when it's in the virus is found normally in our genome, right? This is a normal gene that's found there, right? 
And they found that uh, they found they were able then to isolate DNA that re that represented this from humans and other animals. Right? This gene was already in there. Right? Cancer wasn't some outside invader. This gene was already in the cells. Okay? And they didn't have to wait as long. Right? They got their Nobel Prize in 1989. Right? This is Varmus and that's Bishop. Scientists just get happier and happier as time goes forward. None of them smiled in the old pictures, right? Did both not get the Nobel Prize? No. Yeah, oh well. Um, <laughs> Now, RSV is a retrovirus. Uh, RNA viruses were one of the first model systems ever used to study cancer, right? That's why we're starting with them. Uh, and uh, retrovirus, anyone know another famous retrovirus? Good. It's good. All right. Yeah, HIV, of course, is uh, a retrovirus, right? An RNA virus. And one of the things with RNA viruses is that they uh, have to undergo reverse transcription. Uh, and then they will integrate to form uh, an integrated provirus into the host genome. And what's thought is that when uh, an ALV virion, we'll just start down here, right? When an ALV virion infects a cell, because of abnormal, repeat, abnormal, repeat, not on purpose, accident, it will pick up a human gene transcript. It will be reverse transcribed and integrated with the virus. Okay? So what happens is that SARC gets accidentally uh, integrated, right? The viral version, right? So here's ALV. If you look in the virion, here's RSV. There's our one and a half KB. It's the SARC gene. SARC stands for, what did it cause? Sarcomas. It's a SARC, sarcomas, right? So the SARC gene, right, is carried by the virus. The viral form is V-SARC. The human form would be C-SARC for cellular version. Right, that's that's the convention, V sarc C sarc. Okay, so the viral version doesn't contain introns. What does that say about the source of the gene captured by ALV? Was it DNA or RNA? RNA, right? You only, you only get the introns spliced out in RNA. Yes. Everybody remember that? Okay, yeah. Right? So, so this thing has to essentially get an mRNA and accidentally reverse transcribe it, right? not on purpose, and integrates it into its own genome. And then this whole thing gets packaged, and now we have this new hybrid, which is the RSV. It's got CSARC, and it's got its own DNA. The reason that these things are almost always defective and need help from other viruses is because there's only so much room in here, so you often leave behind something else that you need. Right? They're packaged sometimes just by size. Right? You stuff as much in as you can, and then you cut the DNA. Right? So uh, they're often defective. So GAG is a group-specific antigen. Pole is the polymerase, the reverse transcriptase, and on for structural proteins on the envelope of the protein. Right? But SARC uh, is our... Uh, now oncogene. When it was in the cell, it was a proto-oncogene. Okay. okay, good. So, if SARC is a normal gene, and we know that cells normally have SARC, because we just said that, right? then why does V-SARC, i.e. RSV, cause cancer? Right? Why does that happen? Anyone have any ideas? They almost always are mutated. That's true. Yes. So that's reason one, is that the SARC that it carries, and there's no selective pressure. This virus doesn't need this gene. It doesn't want this gene, right? So it's going to acquire more mutations as you go, right? No, no pressure to, to maintain that, gene, that SARC gene, right, in a virus. So one is that it could be mutated. What else? Yeah. Yeah, 
maybe you have tons of tons of it, right? How many copies of SARC do you have in your DNA? In your genes? Assuming you have two parents, you have two, right? We, it's so sad. Okay. Right? Yeah, two, right? We should have two of most of most what are called single copy genes, most of our genes, right? We have two copies of it. But when the virus goes in, it's gonna have tons of copies, right? Uh, so so you, you can have expression in the wrong place, right? Maybe you have expression in a tissue where you wouldn't normally have lots of SARC expressed. So ectopic means in the wrong place. Ectopic pregnancy, right, is when the baby implants in the wrong place. Ectopic, wrong place. Okay? Uh, maybe you have too much of it, which is what you said, overexpression, right? Maybe you normally have SARC expressed in a cell, but now we have a ton of it in that cell. We have too much, and it causes an issue. Maybe we have it at the wrong time, right? If you have a gene that's only supposed to be on for part of the cell cycle, but now we have it in a virus, and it's being expressed all the time, maybe that's going to cause a problem, right? Or, uh, as was pointed out, maybe it's just wrong, right? Maybe it's mutated, right? So now the signals it's sending are not normal, right? It's doing something uh, that uh, is different uh, than the normal, right? And uh, as was uh, uh, guessed, right, that these viral oncogenes almost always have mutations. Okay. We good? Ooh, quiet. Really quiet. Yeah? Oh, oncogene is one that's causing problems. The proto-oncogene is the is the healthy normal equivalent. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, constantly. Yeah, that's this viruses are thought to cause a total in humans around 15% of cancers. The other 85%, you got to have something break it. Yeah, yeah. Good question. No. Okay. All right. Uh, so, what's the deal with SARC? What does SARC do for a living? Why does it cause cancer when it's in a virus? Uh, so. Here's what SARC is. SARC is a receptor-associated tyrosine kinase, meaning it's a tyrosine kinase that hangs out near cell surface receptors. Right? And it can actually associate with a bunch of different ones. Right? Um, and so what is a tyrosine kinase? I'll briefly talk about this because most of the kinases we're going to see in this whole course are tyrosine kinases and yet they represent only 1% of all of the kinase activity in a cell. So what is a tyrosine kinase? Who's a chem major or someone that knows this? Who had biochem? Someone, help me out. Yes? Um, well, kinase is something that acts like phosphate, but isn't it, it's like a, the receptor tyrosine kinase, it's like a phosphorylation thing, and then it goes to rat. Well, that's, a, that's an example. That's an example. It is an example of a tyrosine kinase. But, but in a general term, what is a tyrosine kinase? It, it, it's a, it is a kinase. Kinases are proteins that add phosphate groups. Yeah? They phosphorylate tyrosine. It's, it's that simple, right? So there are three main targets of phosphorylation in, our, in proteins. That is serine, threonine, and tyrosine, right? Tyrosine phosphorylation is, is just a 1% or so of all of those, but they're critical for cell regulation, cell cycle, cell division, cell death. Tyrosine phosphorylation seems to run away with that. Right? They're, they're very, very good uh, at controlling that. So here is a SARC. Here is a, a receptor. When this receptor dimerizes, uh, because it has bound to whatever, this is as generic as it gets, right? It doesn't matter what receptor this is. Right? But when this receptor is active, the SARC, this is SARC, will interact with it. That interaction causes an activation of uh, SARC. Right? Uh, oh, you know what? Oh, I didn't mean. 
Well, I can't really fix that. Uh, this is supposed to be up there. See that purple thing? Uh, I thought I fixed that. So this purple, this thing comes away and SARC is active. What happens between CSARC and VSARC is that there is a truncation, a mutation that removes a regulatory region of SARC. And so what happens is the control region is deleted and that and this box wasn't supposed to be there. I apologize. I'll fix it on the PowerPoint, uh, on the posted one. Um, but this piece right here is gone in the mutant, not in the normal version. I did this so it would be clearer. I don't think that worked. <laughs> right? So this, in, in the normal version, this is right here. This is our control region. In the mutant, the control region is gone, and the SARC always looks on. Does everyone get that much? Right? So sorry about that. So the normal region, it's off. When it binds, this comes away and it becomes active. In the mutant, there is no control region, so this can't happen, so it always looks on. Yes? So now we have a mutant version of SARC. It's on all the time. And what is it doing? Right? Well, it turns out that SARC is fairly promiscuous, right? Uh, this is, this is a, a kinase that I will associate with pretty much any O receptor, right? Just give it some mitogens, talk nice to it, next thing you know, you're associated, okay? okay. So uh, SARC will associate with a bunch of uh, growth factor receptors. Uh, it'll, it is associated with cell-cell adhesion junctions right, the cadherins. It's associated with complexes that uh, weld cells to the extracellular matrix, okay? And when SARC is active, because these things are active, right, and SARC becomes activated, it leads to uh, the production of uh, activation of pathways, activation of uh, transcription factors, Ultimately, it drives cell division, cell survival, angiogenesis, and movement invasion. Okay. So if you have SARC that's on all the time, you're going to be in real trouble. Everybody get that? Okay. So that's why RSV causes cancer very quickly. Okay. And here's what it looks like. Here is the transformation thing that we were talking about. When that particle infects uh, a cell that's in, a, in what's called a confluent monolayer, i.e. there are no spaces, confluent. They're all touching. Right? What happens is that the cell will round up. Right? Most cells stick down to the plate uh, in the laboratory, in the body, they're also holding on to integrins, to the extracellular matrix, to collagen, to other cells, right? They're always holding on to stuff. But what RSV does, because it affects these junctions, right, it affects the way these things work, that cell rounds up and it forms a blob. You can see the cells are round, right? They're not spread out like these normal ones all stuck down. The reason they look light is because of the refraction through that round cell that's pulled up off the plate. Right? And so here is uh, the, the, what's called a focus, right? one circle blob of cells that are no longer stuck down the way they should be. Okay? Okay? So in vitro, uh, in the 50s, uh, Rubin and Dobeko and uh, Temin, the guy who discovered uh, a lot of the viruses, Dobeko is the guy who made DME, Dobeko's modified the media that you guys use if you culture cells in lab, uh, that's named after him. Rubin, as far as I know, I don't know if the sandwich is him or not, probably not, um, but that would certainly be a legacy. Uh, um, the, he did, they developed the focus forming assay with RSV to study transformation. The first thing, the first in vitro system, big deal, right? We can study this now uh, and figure out what's going on in the lab. 
And they saw this loss of contact-dependent inhibition, density-dependent inhibition. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Again, this is a sim very similar to what we saw last time, just a little better picture. The controls, you get these nice confluent monolayers. Once in a while, there's a cell that's kind of not sticking down. Maybe it's dying, or, or it could be dividing. To divide, the cells sort of have to let go a bit in order to split. Uh, so they're either dividing or, or dead. But uh, this is what you see, and this is what it looks like from above. They're stained with it. I see you can see all of these. One of them is a focus. Plural of focus is foci, right? So lots of foci. Right, of transformation. Right. Uh, and so the transformed phenotype, they have lots, uh, they have special characteristics. They don't stick down, they ball up, they form foci. Here's what a nice happy monolayer looks like. All the cells spread out, welded to each other, stuck down on the plate. Here's what they look like when they're transformed. Okay. They're, they're not stuck to each other and they're not stuck to the substrate either. Yeah. At the point where the focus is created, and we saw that uh, like end of picture where it was like all the way up, mm -hmm. is that when RSV... I mean, probably what happened was if you, if you don't put a ton of the virus in, if you have limiting amounts of virus, you infect a cell, it gets transformed, and then it makes a blob. So it's clonal. Right? If you put a whole bunch of virus, you couldn't guarantee that. Again, another thing that uh, transformed cells will do that normal cells won't is they grow in soft agar. The, the technical term for that is anchorage independent growth. So most cells want to hold on to something. Okay? And they don't like being in an environment where they can't reach out and grab on and hold something tightly. That's why your liver is where you left it the night before. Depending on what you did, it could be smaller, but it's still there. Right? Okay. Uh, but in, in soft agars, everyone know agar is made from seaweed, right? You've made agar plates. Did you know it was from seaweed? Right? Uh, it's in short supply now. Invest. Invest in agar. Right? Invest in seaweed. Right? Uh, so, uh, but if you only put a little bit of the gelling, a little bit of the agar in the solution, it makes it very loose. And so there's not a lot of fibers in there, really, for the cells to hold on to. Most cells will die. Transform cells with SARC in them will form balls. Right? They'll form like a colony, a sphere. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't bother them. If you take transform cells and you put them in an animal, the transform cells uh, will, will grow. Okay? So here are cells that are immortalized using a different viral gene, but they're not tumorigenic. Uh, when you put SARC in, this thing is going to form a mass. It forms a tumor. If you just put the... The, the RK3 cells by themselves, you don't get a tumor. So transformed cells will frequently form tumors in immunocompromised hosts. So the, excuse me, these mice are called nude mice. I don't know if you've ever seen them before, but they are naked. They don't have hair. Uh, that phenotype is unrelated to the reason they're using them. They're not using them to study skin cancer because they're nude. They're using them, the reason they're nude is because they have a genetic defect that renders their immune system completely useless. Okay? So they are not able to reject things. You can take chicken skin and put it on here, and this guy would have feathers. Okay? Uh, they're not able to reject any transplants. Uh, so transform cells will grow in an immunocompromised host. That doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to form a tumor in a normal human or a normal animal. But they will, they will do that. Okay? So these guys are immortal. Okay? All right. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.